Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Today, we're going to talk about things that matter. You know, things like waffle irons and gold watches and handbags that are laden with logos. (laughs) Oh, I'm just kidding. Wait a minute. (laughs) We are going to talk about, on the public podcast today, we're talking about the things that matter, which happens to be the title of Joshua Becker's new book. You should have him on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Joshua Becker is here. Woo! Yeah. One of, oh. one of the original inspirations. I mean, yes. I, I don't think we would be the minimalists without your inspiration, man. Yes, you, indeed. You definitely helped guide us. And, you know, when we, when we first discovered minimalism, it was Colin Wright who owned, you know, 52 Things which was great, but seeing your example was amazing. Like, oh, wow, you can have a family and a full-time job and a house in the suburbs. and Yeah, you can be a regular person and be a minimalist. I'm in. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. and so Joshua Becker and his wife Kim and and their two kids, they were a big inspiration for us early on. We're going to talk about today uh, the things that matter. We're going to answer your questions. This Thursday on the Minimalist Private Podcast... We're going to uh, talk about a few things, including the areas of minimalism and other areas in which we disagree. We'll also talk, talk about overcoming distractions using minimalism. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Joshua Becker, this is a listener driven show. We're so grateful you're here. Let's start with a question from Diane on Patreon. How do I know what truly matters? What can I do if I'm struggling to find meaning in my daily activities? Hmm. Well, I thought we'd start with an easy question. Wow, I'll what? say. Why don't you guys take a stab at it and then um, I can try to... Well, thanks. I have this book here. It's called Things That Matter. And on page 210, literally, you have this uh, chapter about discovering your purposes, Mm. Plural Mm. purposes, right? And you've got this great Venn diagram in here where you talk about the intersection of your passions, your abilities, and others' needs. I was hoping maybe we could start by by sort of expanding on those three areas. Passions, abilities, and uh, people's needs. Um, So I think science backs up my assumption uh, that when we live our lives for other people, uh, when we live a selfless life, helping other people, Mm -hmm. that we reach the end of our lives with more satisfaction in how we chose to live. Mm. And so the book is all about uh, how do I overcome some of these distractions of money, possessions, uh, leisure, the trivial technology, so that I can live a life that that brings the greatest good to the greatest number of people and be proud of the way I lived um, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. And what matters most to us or the good that we can bring into the world is always going to differ based on, uh, I think what our talents and abilities are, what our passions are, and then finding that intersection with what other people's needs are. We can be passionate about things that don't help other people. We can be mm-hmm. passionate about things that we're not very good at. But when we find that that Venn diagram, we find that sweet spot of who am I, uh, what am I passionate about, and who can I help? And it looks different for different, pre- different people. Like mm-hmm. my wife would say, like her greatest passion, her greatest purpose is to raise our two children. Uh, and I would say, I want to reach a million people on my blog. Mm-hmm. Like it, it I want to inspire people to own less. And so it looks... It looks different uh, mm. for different people, but I think that's where the diagram fits together. Mm. Yeah, I, th- I think that we often get overwhelmed because we think we're born to do one thing. I'm supposed to do just this one thing, and then we go searching around for it, wondering whether or not this is the thing that I'm supposed to do. Mm. And in the book, what you lay out is, yeah, it's true. There are many things that you can be passionate about. Now, part of passion involves some sort of excitement, meaning like this thing really makes me feel focused or alive. Mm. But sometimes, in fact, the root of the word passion means to suffer, right? Pass us means to suffer. Mm. And so quite often, it's the thing that makes us feel alive that we have suffered for in order to get there. And so I think there's a sort of amalgamation. So if I am tackling Diane's question head on, uh, Really, if she can't find her passion, where does she start? Other than you have some worksheets in in your book. I mean, that's a great place to start. (laughs) But if she's just listening to the podcast, where does she start? 
Uh, I would uh, I would tell her to uh, start doing something for somebody else in something you feel inspired to do. Uh, this is a little bit unrelated, but I, I sound so smart when I say it. Uh, like, I think one of the biggest problems in the world today is that we judge people who are passionate about different problems than we are mm. too harshly. Mm. Uh, and so if you're not passionate about the exact same problem I'm passionate about, then you're off and you're you're not compassionate or you're distracted or whatever it might be. But in reality, I think we're all wired differently and there are a multitude of problems in the world. Uh, and so I, what's her name, Diane? I, I would tell Diane, I would say, what is one thing that you are, one problem that you see in the world that you want to be a part of the solution? Yes. And then go, maybe you find one person that you can help in that area, or maybe it's a, 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 a nonprofit in your community that's doing that already, but just go start doing something um, and allow that ship to steer because um, it's out in the ocean rather than still sitting at port. Yeah. Another way to look at it is, you know, ask yourself, Diane, how have you been helped? That has really changed your life or that has affected your life. I mean, that's why we're the minimalists because we came across minimalism. We're like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah, I'm going to start living with these values. And then as we started living with these values, it was like, oh, wow, like there's a story here. I can pay this forward and help other people with this idea of minimalism. Um, yeah, I love uh, I love the idea of like what you were saying. Um, figure out a way that you want to help people. Like start there or the ways that you've been helped. We had uh, Erwin Raphael McManus on the podcast a few months ago. And one of the things he talked about is if your purpose only involves you, it's not actually your purpose. Mm. And I find that the things that make us feel the most alive involve other people, serving other people, connecting with other people being with other people, belonging in a way. Now, unfortunately, we try to belong in all these ways that make us miserable. If I just dress the same way, if I just become part of a club or a team or I vote the same way, that's the way I can belong, even if mm -hmm. my values aren't the same. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about pursuing a purpose. What you're talking about is contributing beyond yourself in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a question here from Aiden on Facebook. If you restarted your minimalist journeys with what you know now, what would you change? So, Ryan, last week we actually did an episode about consumer regrets. Right. And on the Maximal episode on the private podcast, we did an episode called Never Buy That Again. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to rehash. You had three big consumer regrets. You had, mm -hmm. I had three. And then we talked about these four non-consumer regrets, mm -hmm. things that we would certainly change. Because I'm not of the mindset where it's like, Oh no, I wouldn't want to change a thing in my life. Of course, mm -hmm. you'd be silly if you didn't have if you had new information, you made the same mistakes. Well, that's the definition of insanity. But I'm more interested in what Joshua Becker, if you were to restart your minimalist journey knowing what you know now, what would you change? Man, I um Maybe talk about that that initial dive into minimalism. I, I mean I mean, the, the first thing that pops in my mind is I would have started sooner, right. but I yeah. mean, can that be my answer? If that can be my answer, <laughs> then uh, obviously I wish I would have started when I was, when I was first married and mm -hmm. uh, didn't waste the first, you know, seven or eight years of my life buying uh, a house that I didn't need and stuff mm -hmm. that I didn't need. Um, that also becomes a distraction because you write about the distractions of the past. And so one of the things we have to be careful of is like, oh, I... W Yes, I wish I would have done it sooner as well. Mm. I, I wish I would have started writing sooner. I wish I would have been living more intentionally sooner. But then, of course, if we just say, well, I guess I'm the kind of person who doesn't live intentionally, that story about our past can define our now. Yeah, and even even that, like maybe I wouldn't go back. I mean, I, I love that my story, <clears throat> I, I found minimalism when my son was five and my daughter was two and... I was cleaning out the garage on a Saturday morning while my son played alone in the backyard and my neighbor introduced me to the word minimalism. And as I had spent hours cleaning out the garage with my son alone, like there was the realization that my things weren't just not making me happy, but my things were distracting me from the things that did bring me happiness and joy and meaning and life. Um, but I think that I'm able to connect with people 
because of that story in a way that maybe I wouldn't have been able to connect with people if I started when I was in my 20s and that was always what my what my life looked like. So yeah. maybe I wouldn't even go back and change that. I I, I don't know. I don't know what I would change. Yeah. Yeah. I, this is always man, a does that question. sound arrogant? No, not at all. Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I don't I I don't even know if there was a different order of rooms that I would go through to declutter. I don't know. Maybe I would have done a packing party and <laughs> started that first. I don't know. Other than oh, that, what can I come up yeah. with? No, I mean, it's a tough question because I think the same thing. It's like, you know, I look at my childhood and it was rough and um, I would love to have it have gone differently. But in the same token, like I'm this version of myself today because of that crappy childhood. So, you know, if I didn't, you know, get those those lessons or get that trauma, who would I be today? I don't know. I mean, this is always a interesting question because of course I wish, you know, I wish uh, my dad didn't beat me or my step, I should say my stepdad. Sorry, dad, if you're listening to this, <laughs> my, my stepdad. Uh, or I wish that, um, you know, the SWAT team didn't kick on our door in the eighth grade. But um, but yeah, who knows who I would be without those experiences and traumas. I, I like joke around about how, you know, when Mariah and I have kids, um, because I can look at those traumas and how they've affected me. It's like, how do you give a child the right amount of trauma? <laughs> What's too much trauma? What's not enough trauma? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, think, I think the number of trauma is zero <laughs> right, that yeah. you want to, to give to a kid. But um, it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be challenges and adversity along the way. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we sort of nerf the entire world for our children or for mm -hmm. ourselves, then we don't develop into the person that we are right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the trauma is going to come whether you try to prescribe the right amount <laughs> or, not. It or not. Yeah. <laughs> you probably wouldn't plan injecting in intentional trauma. Right, right, right. I guess it's more about how do you deal with the trauma? Like on a serious note, it is. Yeah. It's, it's how do you deal with the traumas that, that come along? Um, all right. No injecting trauma. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to our callers. If you have a question or comment for our podcast, give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We have a question today from Crystal in St. Cloud, Minnesota. So way back a couple of months ago, I decided, you know what? I'm going to always have a car payment. I might as well go and buy a fancy car with all the bells and whistles, and leather interior, sunroof. Um, and that obviously came with a really high um, car payment and high price tag. And I'm on the hook for that for the next seven years. Since then, I've you know really adopted um, a new lifestyle and a new outlook, um, trying to be more minimalist. And the large car payment that I have to pay every month does not align with my values, nor can I actually afford it. Um, so I don't want to take on a second job just to drive the fancy car. So I'm wondering... What can I do? Can I return the car to the dealership? Um, I'm sure I would take a loss on that. Is that loss worth it? Or should I just, you know, I'm stuck with it and pay it and then not repeat the same mistakes um, in seven years from now once it's paid off? I've looked online uh, <clears throat> for an answer and haven't really come up with much. So, Crystal, this is, we were actually on the Maximal episode. We were arguing about shoulds and, uh, this is one of those mimetic shoulds. Everyone, oh, I guess I should have a car payment, right? Mm -hmm. Our society tells us that's what you're supposed to do. And one of the things that so many people, Joshua, they got really upset with me recently because we, Danny put out a TikTok video and there was a video of me saying, if you have to finance a car, you can't afford it. Now, I called up an economist friend of mine because so many people like, had backlash, mm -hmm. hundreds of, of hateful comments. Oh, my God. And... and <clears throat> Just by definition, that ends up being true. If you have to finance something, and it wasn't a judgment of anyone else. No. If I wanted a Lamborghini, I'd have to finance it I, because I can't afford it. I can't pay for a Lamborghini. And unfortunately, that's where Crystal is right now. She's been told by society, oh, I guess you're always going to have a car payment. You should have a car payment, right? And now she's even contemplating, do I, have, do I get a second job in order to pay for the car that takes me to my first job? And you talk about this in the book the sort of distraction of more possessions, but then also this is another distraction of adulation or applause. What are people going to think of me? If I, if I drive the really nice car, they're going to think nice things about me, mm. right? And so, I mean, we, obviously we follow Dave Ramsey pretty closely. We work with Dave Ramsey on some stuff and, and we, Ryan and I don't do any debt other than mortgage debt. And even then I'd prefer not to have it. Mm -hmm. I, I, 
personally would never want to have a, a car payment because I think it restricts some of my freedom. Do you share that viewpoint? Uh, concerning car payments? Yeah. Yeah. Never had a car payment. Um, wow. I got, uh, I got awesome. real good advice. Um, when I was, when I was young, uh, they said, <clears throat> um, save up the money. Uh, this was when I was in college. So I was driving my parents' vehicle. So I suppose I should count that. Um, save up the money and then whatever cash you have on hand, use that to buy a car. And then whatever your car payment would have been, save that amount into the bank. And then whenever that beater car wears out, you can sell it and whatever you have saved up, use that to buy the next car and then just put your car payment into a bank. So a little bit, uh, just going it, uh, just doing it backwards. And we've, uh, we've done that our, our entire lives. And so never That's had awesome. a car payment. That's why he has um, a Bentley now <laughs> because he just kept saving and saving. Yeah, like, yeah. What is a Bentley payment? $5,000 a month. <laughs> <Yeah>. All right. <clears throat> Granted started out with, you know, my parents' car. So, um, I mean, there's a little bit of help from the very first car, which is mm -hmm. probably the toughest one to buy. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know what specific advice, uh, what was, what was the name? Her um, name's Crystal. Uh, Crystal. I, <clears throat> I mean, you're at, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the specific advice for Crystal is to, is to honestly do the math. Um, I mean, I think the market for used cars has never been better than it is right now. Great and so point. I like, I would do the math, like what, what can you sell this car for? Um, are you underwater in it? How long would it take to get on the right side of it? Um, mm. Maybe sell it now, maybe. Um, yeah. I don't know, probably would now, unless you can lose a bunch of money on it right away at the beginning. Then uh, you, do you just take the, do you just take the loss and- Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, how, how is she gonna buy a car if she's underwater several thousand? I, if I, I don't if know. I'm in her shoes <clears throat> and I could find a way to get rid of the car, even <clears throat> if it's a, a loss of money, let's say the car is a, for the sake of easy math here, it's a $30,000 car and you can get $25,000 for it because mm -hmm. the market's fairly solid right now. You're going to lose, say you're underwater $5,000. Mm -hmm. It's a five. The question you ask here is how much did this mistake cost me? Mm -hmm. It cost you $5,000, right? A as opposed to continuing to make this a 40,000, because with interest, it's going to be a $40,000 mistake mm -hmm. over the next seven years, the seven year mistake. And so, well, Crystal, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I know certainly what I would do if I were in your shoes. Mm -hmm. I'd buy a $2,000 beater, whatever I could find that's going to get me from point A to point B. It may even inject a little bit of discomfort in my life, right? Oh mm -hmm. no, the air conditioning doesn't really work well in this thing. Mm -hmm. Oh no, there's no Bluetooth in this car, right? Whatever am I going to do without these luxuries? Mm -hmm. But also recognizing that now I don't have the burden. I would much rather drive a car that is paid for than have the burden of a monthly car payment every single month. And I, so I have a lot of compassion for Crystal, because I put myself in this situation. There was a part, there was a time where I had three luxury cars and then I stumbled across becoming minimalist.com and I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing? I'm, at, I'm making three car payments mm. and I'm spending all this money to impress a bunch of people who aren't really that impressed. They might say, oh, sweet car or whatever, or even worse, I'll say, oh, it must be nice. Rob mm. Bell talks about this sometimes mm. about you know, the, the sort of people in your life, if they approach life in a way where it's, it's, it's a judgmental sort of thing. Hey, you know, oh, it must be nice to, well, no, it wasn't actually nice. It just mm. looked nice. Mm. Paying three car payments every month is not nice. It's incredibly stressful. And it's, it actually, we buy these things to give us security. They bring us more insecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, and you know, like, like this is not, well, like when you mentioned the, um, if you have to take a loan out on a car, you can't afford it. That's not, there's no value judgment attached to that. I mean, it's, it just is, it's not good. It's not bad. It's just, a, it's just a statement. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, know, I don't think it's immoral to, to go exactly. to debt. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what, what Crystal's going through right now, it's what it is doing is it's anxiety producing. So how can you lift that stress out of your life? I mean, when I first went down the road to minimalism, I had a car payment. I looked at, how much I needed to pay off. I went to Craigslist. I put it up for sale. Um, and then I went and and got, I think at the time the Corolla was probably worth 3000 bucks, mm -hmm. maybe 3,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I went from a nice 
luxury vehicle to a Corolla and I got judged for it. Like I'll never forget like the first first time I went to go uh I was on I was on a board and I was leading this meeting. I won't say what cuz I don't want to like call anyone out, but um the uh the CEO of the company of the board I was on, we were like walking out to the parking lot and he saw my Corolla. He's like, "What is this?" I'm like, this is my car, man. I had to get rid of my car payment. You know, I'm a minimalist now. Like, I got to start making better decisions. He's like, mm, I don't like it. And I'm like, well, I don't care if you like it or not. <laughs> like, this is what I had to do to to move my life forward. So, yeah, Crystal, you might have to get a little bit lesser of a car, but you could take the approach I did. I mean, even let's say you don't have two thousand dollars on hand, uh, you can take your your what you owe on it add $2,000 to it. And then, yeah, go on Craigslist and maybe find someone who's willing to pay you that much for the car. But I agree with you, Becker. Like it has never been a better time to sell used cars right now. Like they are in pretty high demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think the cost of this mistake will help you avoid making the same mistake again Ooh. and again now that you've realized it. Because mm -hmm. the problem is when we finance cars, we keep making the same mistake because we think that's what we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to have a monthly car payment for the rest of my life. Yeah. Let's turn over to the live stream. Alabama, what do we got? Any questions? We have a question from Anne. I find myself putting minimalism at the center of my focus rather than using it as a tool to make room for the things that matter in life. Do you identify with this feeling? Mm. Becker, thoughts? <clears throat> I never... Um, set minimalism as the greatest goal in my life. Mm. Um, and I, I almost, I almost feel bad saying that. And I'm, I'm like really searching my heart to, to make sure I'm, I'm true in saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it is true. Like I, uh, that Saturday morning, I wanted to have more time available with my family. And so I wanted to own less stuff. And I always saw minimalism would help me get there. Mm. Now, as I started pursuing this, uh, minimalism became much more of an obsession to me. Like as I saw owning less, improving my life, I, I became consumed with what else can I get rid of? Mm -hmm. And honey, why did you buy that thing? <laughs> and like even, even probably to this day, 13 years later, like I still... We had a package show up from Amazon last night. And uh, I'm like, what is this, mm. kids? Like, well, <laughs> we don't know who bought it. I think my son bought it from college and shipped it to our house. But I'm like, well, who's buying this? Um, mm. But it it certainly became, uh, it certainly became uh, something that I obsessed over uh, to a degree. Um, and I, I, I don't know if, I, I don't know if you could change that from the beginning. I feel like I had to, to kind of go through that and recognize it and mm -hmm. say, hey, this has become a little bit unhealthy in how I'm talking to my wife. Like this has become unhealthy in how I'm just constantly scouring my house, trying to find things that I should be getting rid of and shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that way, I think it became a little bit of an obsession. But I mean, I, I wrote a blog post really early on that like, I don't want to be known as a good minimalist. That That was never what I wanted to be known yeah. for. Like I, I wanted to be known as a, uh, a a faithful follower of God. I wanted to be known as a good father. I wanted to be known as a, a faithful husband. I wanted to be known as, you know, someone who made a difference in the world. Like, like this is who I want to be remembered for, not not being a minimalist. So yeah. um, I, I'm sure it's not uncommon that um, minimalism becomes the obsession right away. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, but for me, it was, it was always a means to an end. It, it, but man, that's just how I was introduced to it. When I, when I read yeah. the book, at first I thought it was going to tell me what things matter, meaning like what possessions in my house are going to be the, the most useful or most valuable to me. And then I realized early on what you were talking about are, are all of these distractions that keep us from the things that matter. And one of those distractions that you talk about in the book is stuff. And that becomes a distraction. But in a way, getting rid of the stuff, if we're solely focused on getting, that's still a distraction by stuff. And so what you're, what you're pointing out here is we often trade consumerism for simply decluttering. Whereas with minimalism, 
the decluttering is a tool that allows us to uncover what is important, Mm -hmm. whether it is your faith, your family, the activities, the contribution beyond yourself, your passions. It's not about being a good minimalist, just like it's not about buying. When we buy a hammer, we don't obsess over the hammer. The hammer does the job. It is the tool. And in many ways, minimalism is a tool that uncovers the things that matter. I was very early on um, uh, in this process, getting rid of things, and I, um, I was surprised at how introspective I became about owning less stuff. And I, it was a, it was a short blog post. I used to blog like once or twice a day, and just a couple of paragraphs at a time. Like that was what becomingminimalist.com used to be. And I remember writing how. I'm just surprised at how, what deep questions about my life this process is bringing to the forefront. Mm. And uh, uh, Dustin Hirschberger, I still remember the name, commented back on the blog. And uh, he said, it seems to me minimalism would force questions of values upon you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, that is exactly what is happening. Like you can't decide what you need to keep until you get, well, the process of deciding what to keep can't help but include, like, what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to be with my life? What do I want to accomplish with my life? What things are important to me uh, can't help but surface as we're going through this, going through this process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's minimalism is a tool to help you uncover the important things in your life. And you know, man, when you get rid of distractions, sometimes like that's the hard part. It's like, oh man, like what do I want? But if minimalism becomes the focus, I mean, you can't, you can't make room for more minimalism. Eventually you're going to get to a point where you do have to ask these tough questions. We did, we did an episode on Spartanism, which is sort of the other side of hoarding. They're mm-hmm. both on the OCD continuum. But Spartanists are people who can't hold on to anything. And I think minimalism is somewhere, somewhere in between. It allows me to hold on to the things that are useful, that are valuable, whether they're actual physical things. But they're also the people that enrich my life and I enrich their lives. Mm-hmm. And, and so we are able to hold on, just like when my daughter is climbing the monkey bars. You have to be able to hold on and let go in order for it to work. Mm. If you can do nothing but let go, you're slipping and falling, Mm. right? If you can do nothing but holding on, you stay stuck. Mm. I bet you the person asking this question um, could probably identify what minimalism is making room for. Yeah. And uh, that's... Maybe they don't even realize what minimalism has opened them up towards. Um, But yeah, maybe they're focused on minimalism because it's allowed them to get out of debt. It's allowed them to spend more time with family. It's allowed them to, you know, leave that toxic relationship, whatever it is. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, there's some good side effects happening from minimalism. Yeah, definitely. Before we go into the lightning round, Ryan, I wanted to reach out to Crystal here in St. Cloud, Minnesota and say, we're going to be in your city. Well, almost. We're going to be in Minneapolis, right down the street from you. The Love People Use Things Tour. We have uh, two American cities left, Chicago, Minneapolis, both this month. We'll give you a couple tickets, Crystal, for the Minneapolis event. We'll also be in Toronto and Vancouver later this year. Theminimalists.com slash tour. If you'd like tickets to any of those final four Love People Use Things events. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions. You can text your comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Now, Joshua Becker, this is where we and our guests, we answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims. But really what we do is we maunder on a bit until podcast Sean, he tweezes out something pithy and beautiful. He puts it in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. I am going to test all of his skills <laughs> in teasing out something. He'll cut your mic off eventually. <laughs> he, he brought a bag full of M dashes. So. Right. <laughs> Perfect. We have a question here from Annette. I'm a member of the sandwich generation, meaning I take care of my aging parents as well as my children. How can I prioritize my needs without forsaking those I have to care for? Now, Ryan is part of the sandwich eating generation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I just love sandwiches. 
<laughs> Dude, that was on my OK Cupid profile. And, <laughs> and Mariah was like, because it was a joke, but she was like, oh, I like sandwiches too. <laughs> and, but I'm just saying that's what brought us together. Our love for sandwiches. Perfect. And now she can't eat sandwiches because she's gluten intolerant. Anyway. <laughs> Thanks to you. You've ruined her life. <laughs> Poor Mariah. I know. I question her judgment all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, uh, a next question here. So, taking care of aging parents as well as my children, how can I prioritize my needs without forsaking those I have to care for? What thoughts do you have? Oh, my goodness. Um, my first thought is thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for raising your children intentionally. Uh, thank you for taking care of your parents. Mm. Uh, not everyone does. Um, so I would start there. Um, I, uh, you might have more in the moment wisdom. Um, but I would, I would remind her that, that this is, uh, a season of life, uh, where she's probably going to have to give more of herself. Um, uh, there'll come a time where her kids are older and she won't have to put as much effort in uh, raising them. Uh, there'll come a time where her parents aren't around anymore uh, and won't require that energy. Um, but I would uh, I would look for help um, from your friends uh, as best you possibly can. Uh, and I would realize that uh, that this season won't uh, won't last forever. Mm -hmm. um, but you are doing a noble thing. And um, you should be tired when you go to bed at night, but you should be proud of the day. I notice Amen. you're getting super emotional on this. Um, what what bring what stirs up those emotions in you? What are you thinking about? Um, I'm just thinking that uh, that that she doesn't have to do that. I, I mean, like, not everyone. Um, raises their children well, and not everyone uh, takes care of their aging parents well. Mm. And uh, to hear that she is uh, makes me proud to get to meet her over the over the internet. Yeah. And I, I think she needs to hear that if she's not hearing it. Yeah, amen. I think quite often we talk about our priorities, right? And it seems to me that you've and that you've identified what your priorities are right now. And unlike me in my 20s, I said a lot of things are my priorities, right? But the funny thing is priorities don't even exist. Priority exists. You know, priority simply means the first thing. Mm -hmm. And in my 20s, I had about 300 the first things. Mm. And then by definition, everything was valuable to me. So no nothing was valuable to me. So if I have a pithy answer for you, it's simply that our priorities are showcased not by what we say, but how we spend our days. And how you're spending your days right now so sounds to me like you're doing something that's incredibly meaningful. It's also really difficult because maybe you feel like you don't have enough time for yourself. And yes, there may be times where you have to make that time for yourself you, so that you can have, you can fill the cup so you can pour it out into the, the people that you, you need to pour out because you can't, as you say in the book, you can't pour out anything from an empty cup, mm. right? And so I think maybe that's where the the discontent sets in here or the stress is like, I don't feel like I have enough to give. And you may not be able to do everything that you think you're supposed to do, everything that you should do. Mm -hmm. But it sounds to me like if you're contributing beyond yourself to these other people, you're doing something that is noble and you, you need to be applauded for that. Yeah. Amen. Uh, my pithy answer is boundaries protect boundless love. So I love what you said, Becker, about this being a season of life. And there might be some boundaries she needs to set. Maybe it's, maybe it's with her kids or her parents, but it might be outside of that where she's putting too much on herself that is really uh, depleting her tank. Or maybe she's, you know, she's at a deficit each day. But since it is a season, because I know with our friends and our, our family, like we would just want to say yes to everything. And we can't, we, we really can't. And I think if there's someone in your life that you can set a boundary with, 
uh, if it's if they're close to you, they're going to understand. You can say to them, hey, look, I got I have a lot of responsibility right now with my parents. I have a lot of responsibilities right now with my kids. I would love to do that thing for you or with you. Um, but but I have to say no so I can say yes to taking care of, of my parents and my kids. And uh, I'm going to have to say no for quite a while. Um, but the people who love and respect you and want you to be happy, they're going to understand those boundaries. And it's it's not an unloving thing to set boundaries. And I feel like when we, when I tell someone, no, I often feel like, oh man, I'm being a jerk or I'm, they're going to think I'm being selfish or whatever it is. But if you explain to them what you're saying yes to, um, does it come across as so selfish? Well, we got a lot more to talk about, but real quick, we're right here right now. There's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Ryan and I have worked on nine philanthropic projects over the last decade or so. A couple with Joshua Becker, the, yeah. the Hope Effect, which is a charity he started to help build a, a few orphanages with them over the years. We just started working on a new project right now with uh, Dave Ramsey. We're going to educate every middle school student and every high school student in Dayton, Ohio, our hometown. We're raising money to do that. Ryan and I just paid money to educate the first hundred students. It's about financial literacy. Mm. So we've partnered with Ramsey to get their curriculum literally into every middle school and every high school in Dayton, Ohio. And if this goes well quickly, we're going to expand it beyond the borders of, of our hometown into other cities across the United States and elsewhere, yeah. getting that curriculum out there. So so we can set kids up without debt, without the stress, without the anxiety, without borrowing from their future in order to do something right now, giving them that financial literacy because the average American indebted household has $97,775 in non-mortgage debt. And so we've set ourselves up in a sort of prison, a prison of debt. And so we want to help a whole bunch of kids, middle school kids, high school kids. You can help out with that. If you go to theminimalists.com slash education, you can find all the details, the frequently asked questions. $25 will provide the curriculum for one middle school student, $45 for one high school student. Or if you can just donate five bucks, that would help us out as well. Theminimalists.com slash education. Alabama, what else you got for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Hi, my name is Morgan. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm calling regards to um, someone who asked about their camping gear and having all that stuff like in their house and wanting to minimize it. Um, one option that we actually have in Milwaukee is the Urban Ecology Center. It's a nonprofit, and um, this group you donate thirty-five dollars a year as a single person. And it really just goes towards keeping the nonprofit going. They try and get community involvement and education around um, the environment and preserve the wildlife in Milwaukee. Uh, but the awesome thing about them is that they uh, offer free camping gear and uh, kayaks and bikes, like anything that you want to rent. You can rent for up to three days or longer if you get a special request. Um, I'm sure they're not the only city that there's an option like this out there. So just something to keep in mind that there might be even like community groups in the area that help you have access to those items, but not have to have them in your own home. Hi, this is Bethany from Maine. I started minimizing earlier this year when I was pregnant. My son is now six months old. After much deliberation, I decided to start a small memory box for him, as I have enjoyed having some items from my childhood growing up, and this may add value to his life at some point. I will save a few items, such as his, as his hospital bracelet, birth announcement, and a baby outfit. As he gets older, he can decide if he wants to contribute any items to his box, but any saved items have to fit in the bin. The important thing is that I don't attach sentiment to these items and project my own emotions on my son. He will decide what adds value. When he is an adult, he can choose to keep some, all, or no items. I will allow him to make this choice with no guilt or expectations on my part. All right, y'all. Big thanks to our friend Joshua Becker. His new book is called Things That Matter. You can find it over at becomingminimalist.com. That's his blog. He's also going on tour 12 cities in the United States. You can find those cities at becomingminimalist.com. This book just came out today. And Joshua, I want to thank you. I want to acknowledge you for writing this. I know you said... Uh, 
we were talking about this on the live stream, but there was a point after you wrote uh, The Minimalist Home and then The More of Less, which were your two previous books. I'm not going to write another book. I think I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. And then you felt a calling to write this because we are so distracted. And it's not just with stuff. It's all these other areas. And we talk about on the Maxwell episode, we'll talk about the eight areas of distraction. But in this book, you dive deep into all of these things that get in the way of a meaningful life. And I want to say thank you for the, for just thank you for writing this. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words. I, uh, I hope that, I hope the thoughts in the book uh, spark new thoughts um, for people and uh, provide help and thoughts. And um, uh, I, I, I just, there's a lot of good available in the world. I mean, there's just a lot of good that's being bottled up. Um, and like I say in the book, I think we're, we're all created to, to bring a good into the world. Uh, and the, the less we're distracted by things that don't matter, the, the more good uh, we can bring and the more people we can help. And so I hope the book um, does that on a personal level for people and uh, for society as a whole. So thanks for letting me chat with you guys. It's been thanks good. Thanks so much. You're awesome, man. Check out his YouTube channel as well. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well as Becoming Minimalist, the book as well, and his tour. The Things That Matter Tour, coming to a city near you or just a nice little road trip away. Sometimes that happens, right? People like come to uh, yeah, move or go several states over to see an event. You'll see quite a few of those. Yeah. See him while he's on the road when you have a chance. For added value this week, Ryan, Graham Colton put out a new EP. Hmm. The EP is called Remember When... And it's a few new songs, but then his most popular song is a song called Best Days. And it's like a kind of rocky song. He does this acoustic version of it. I thought we'd end the show today because the song really highlights, well, giving up the things we thought were important so we can enjoy the best days of our lives. And the best days of our lives are right now. We can uncover that when we get rid of the things that don't matter and make room for the things that do. So enjoy this song from Graham Colton. This is the acoustic version of Best Days. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm sure they can click right here, right, Jordan? Somewhere up here, and you can find it. By the way, Ryan, we got a bunch more surprise questions this week, like, what is Joshua Becker's definition of minimalism, and how does it differ from the minimalist's definition? What are the eight biggest distractions in most people's daily lives? I've heard the minimalists dislike logos, but what's the problem with wearing logos? Plus a million more questions for Joshua Becker and the Minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, check out the Minimalist private podcast this week. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalist to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You also gain access to hundreds of hours of private archives, recordings of live events, exclusive home tours, and our private community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalist on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at The Minimalist. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Alabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, Danny Unknown, Emma the Immigrant, and the rest of our team, I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.